Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever time of day it is. Thank you for tuning in to Conversations with Dr. Don. The show is produced and broadcast from Portland, Oregon, USA. For your first time viewers, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like my two guests tonight. Uh, about who they are as unique, one-of-a-kind individuals and about whatever it is we have decided to talk about. We'll be talking about how federal action might influence Oregonians' health care. Now, these guys have been on this show repeatedly <laughs> for a number of years. We're repeat offenders. <laughs> repeat <Yeah>. offenders. <laughs> See, this is how it's going to be. And i uh, got to have them on again. And You'll be on the end in the future because you're so darn interesting and you're so up on what's topical and what I think is important to, uh, to talk about among fellow humans on this earth. Hopefully, as we're through two, three, or four years apart, we have some, something new other than the usual stuff we talk about you when you talk about who you are. And I'll find another goofy question to ask you to get some spontaneous. Uh, and and go, instead of going through the litany of question by question, I'd ask you to summarize uh, who you are, and maybe I'll ask a few questions, or maybe one or the other will help me ask the other one a question to get that out of the way. So we want to allow a lot, of, a lot of time for what we'll be talking about, because what you're talking about for me personally is the federal action in Oregonians' health care. Yes. And I was summarizing for my wife last night how, I, how I'm associated with health care and things related to it. And, uh, and there's about four or five different acronyms for the organizations I belong to, to do to do with health and health care. But I won't go into them right now because my memory isn't as long as it used to be. <laughs> All right. Okay. I was born in New Orleans, Louisiana, red, white, and black Roman Catholic parentage on December 26th, 1928. Today, I am a religious and accepting of all others. I am a retired PhD clinical psychologist and present-day television broadcast journalist. I am the 12th of 12 children and married and am the father of five daughters by first marriage. Politically, I am a progressive populist activist, still learning how to live lovingly, still learning how to live lovingly. That's very important for me. A few of my heroes include Jesus, Gandhi, MLK, and other, any other fellow human who is currently living lovingly. And uh, my later new friends and associates now, I look up to them because of what they're about. I'm not just laying it on here. And uh, you're my heroes in that small way, if I may. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, who shall we have be the victim first? You or you, Sam? Uh, Sam uh, Metz, yes. MD, Dr. Metz. Yes. And <laughs> Steve Weiss. Did I get uh, that right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'll go first. Okay, uh, Sam. I am second generation American. Mm -hmm. uh, three of my four grandparents came over from the old country. My grandfather was a, an orthodox rabbi of a cons conservative congregation in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. I was pleased a few years ago to take my son when he was just a much younger teenager to the old synagogue building at 6th and I in Washington, D.C. and there's a plaque on the wall to honor the memory of Solomon H. Metz, my grandfather and Alex's great-grandfather. Uh, I would consider myself a secular Jew and my politics are uh, your standard pin-headed, bleeding heart, tax and spend Multnomah County Democrat. <laughs> I can't say Multnomah that. Multnomah County mm, in Portland. <laughs> yes. I can't be much more original than that. That's pretty good. <laughs> we also, well, Steve and I owe you a debt because it was on this show in 2010 mm -hmm. that the Mad as Hell Doctors Organization was yeah, born. Yeah, I, I still belong to that. Yes, which 
at, at its time was Oregon's most progressive, aggressive physician organization for universal care that you know, took a uh, Winnemucca uh, RV across the country giving people their mad as hell minutes to talk about how they and their families had been let down by the healthcare system. And what started on this show eventually climaxed with one of our members being on the White House lawn when uh, <laughs> Barack Obama announced the signing of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, Paul did not stand up and say, big deal, where's the single payer? Because after all, he was seated on the lawn in the, on the White House front, uh, front yard, and you're supposed to follow a little sense of decorum then. Mm -hmm. Paul so, Gorman. Uh, actually, this is Paul Hockfeld of Corvallis, yes, who, yes. like you, has done quite a bit of media production mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. He didn't... Uh, I don't know how he got in. I don't think he scaled the fence to get into the White House. <laughs> he wore a white coat and a stethoscope, and I think he was invited in from the line of visitors. There's probably a story there. We should get him on your, on your show, John. <laughs> yeah. What else about you that <clears throat> maybe something new we haven't heard before that you might add to this who you are tonight? When maybe something we, in the last seven years or so that we haven't uh, learned about uh, you? Haven't done anything interesting the last seven years, but I can tell you that when I decided I would apply to medical school, I was earning my living as a cross country tractor trailer driver for Willis Shaw Frozen Express out of Boise, Idaho. <laughs> and I probably put more miles on the road than a lot of people have. Uh, I shouldn't have asked that question. I knew he'd come up with something that's so far-fetched. <laughs> Are you still practicing at all? No, I retired a few months ago. Really? And I can devote myself full-time to the kind of ankle-biting that we love to do as progressive liberals. You're going to have a hard time following this. <laughs> I'll well, do my you've best. actually done something useful. I mean, besides drive a truck. <laughs> Shall we switch over? Mm -hmm. any, any questions you want to ask uh, Sam? Uh, shall we go in? Not right now. Yeah. Uh, it'll come later on. Mm -hmm. Who are you, Steve? Well, I'm also a uh -huh. second generation American. Mm -hmm. My um, grandparents on my father's side were Russian peasants. They came here in 1909. And my grandparents on my mother's side, um, my grandfather was a baker by trade and continued that trade when he came to this country in 1903. Um, both sets of grandparents emigrated to New York City. Uh, that's where I was born and raised. Um, we'll forgive you. <laughs> Uh, these days, I'm an advocate and activist. Um, Are you ever? I belong to multiple organizations and have been on multiple organizations in the last 22 years as an advocate in this town and at the state level on occasion. Um, the first 50 years of my life were not particularly distinguished. I did graduate from college. Um, I was the first in my family to do that. But a lot of things got in my way, including the military draft in the 1960s. I was an open war resistor and draft resistor. Thought that I was going to go to jail for my draft resistance and was never prosecuted. Um, there were tens of thousands of guys like me who were in that position, open resistors. But we clogged the docket of the U.S. Justice Department, and most of us were not prosecuted. But we weren't told that we were not mm -hmm. going to be prosecuted. So in the meantime, and some of us started. had a lot of years of worry and concern about when the ax would fall. Of course, it never did. Part of, part of it was relief when Gerald Ford issued his amnesty, but it was the Carter amnesty. 
um, shortly after he was elected that got all of us off the hook, so to speak, legally. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a very difficult time for me psychologically. I can imagine. Worrying about going to jail. I knew I'd rather go to jail than fight in a war that I and many others thought was illegal, immoral, and unjust. And uh, I think, Don, you remember that phraseology mm -hmm. because it was very popular in those days, and it's still true as well. Are there any just wars today? None that I know of, except the war on poverty in the 1960s, such as it was. Lyndon, Lyndon Johnson sabotaged that war by all the time and money and material and human beings he spent in prosecuting the war in Vietnam. And in the end, he came to regret, I think, that he did that. Um, so no, I don't think there are any just wars going on today unless you want to consider that there's still a war on poverty and I'm part of that war. And there's a war for me on the Trump administration and the Republican Party. It's nonviolent, but it's a war nonetheless. Say a few words about that war. My life is enabled by six federal social safety net programs. Medic six? Six. Medicare, Medicaid, Supplemental Security Income, SSI, yeah. the Section 8 program, the housing program, yeah. um, the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, and the SNAP program, that's the program formerly known as food stamps. I benefit from being on all six programs and the Trump administration wants to cut them, all six of them significantly, that can not only upend and ruin my life, it can ruin the lives of tens of millions of people in this country. Whether that actually happens remains to be seen. Well, aren't those some version of socialism? Those organizations you mentioned? Yes, that, and that takes me to telling you, as you, as you well know, <laughs> that for the last 33 years, I've been a member of Democratic Socialists of America. And, and um, I have too for a long time. It's also, for those who don't know, the organization, socialist organization that Bernie, Bernie Sanders has worked most closely with over the years. Mm -hmm. And I'm still very fond of DSA. I just renewed my membership for another year. Yeah. And so, yes, socialism is important to me, and it's one of the reasons I'm heartened these days is because of what Jerry, Jeremy Corbyn is doing in the United Kingdom. Uh, he's galvanized a lot of British voters and galvanized the Labor Party, and I hope that somehow that spreads to this country in some way. Bernie Sanders was in the UK a week and a half ago yeah. giving his support to Corbyn, and I was very pleased by that. So I'm very cautiously hopeful about some things and very worried about others. Yeah. Is the socialism that you embrace the same as the socialism of Joe Stalin? No. Oh, how is that different? Fewer gulags, for one thing. <laughs> Sam, is, Sam is right. <laughs> Stalin was an authoritarian, yes. in some ways like President Trump, actually. Um, and he committed many crimes in the, so in the Soviet Union. Uh, he's not my kind of uh, Russian socialist, but, and he never gets any credit, Mikhail Gorbachev is my kind of Russian socialist. He styled himself as a democratic socialist, and I think he is. We don't hear from him no enough. He doesn't get credit from the Russian public, which for reasons I don't understand, don't seem to realize just how much he did to get rid of the yoke of authoritarianism. Now we have a right-wing authoritarianism in Russia, led by Vladimir Putin. Mm. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> okay, Sam. Well, I would like to add about to this table of, that's a hotbed of socialist <laughs> intrigue that <laughs> the, the concept of single-payer health care, labeled as socialist by those who would not make a profit off of it, 
It was created by, invented, perfected by an American capitalist named Henry J. Kaiser, who had no more heart than your average Robert Barron. And he was, his company was building dams in the middle of the American West. And he came up with three brilliant ideas. Actually, it was the company physician, Sidney Garfield, but he took credit for it. Kaiser mm -hmm. said, if I can keep my employees healthy, they'll be more productive and I'll make a lot more money. And then he thought, if I keep my employees and their families healthy, yeah. I can attract and keep productive employees and I'll make more money. And finally, he figured out, if I pay physicians directly without letting it get filtered through an insurance company, and pay them the same no matter which one of my employees they see. Costs will go down and I'll make more money. And he was right on all three counts. Not only was he right for Kaiser, but every large corporation that can possibly do it in the United States has emulated this private single payer model. Anyone in the United States who works for a business that employs more than 4,000 people has a 95% chance of already getting their health care through a private single payer corporation. You know, single payer health care is more American than apple pie. It predates the birth of Donald Trump. Uh, you want an American solution to an American problem created by an American who believed that rich people should make more money? Single payer health care is your answer. Was Henry Kaiser a socialist or a capitalist or a bit of both? Makes him smart. And he didn't care that people would call it socialized medicine. He said, as long as I make money off of it, as long as my costs go down and my income goes up and my employees stay healthy and productive, you can call it whatever you want. Yeah, but I think wouldn't, wouldn't be, we be invited, particularly into politics in America, to uh, categorize him as either a, a, a capitalist or a socialist. Well, it, if he's a socialist, then there aren't many capitalists left in the United States. <laughs> uh, if, you, if you have to be more right-wing than Henry J. Kaiser to be considered not a socialist, it's a real small population there. <laughs> we think of single payer is a way to take money out of the mouths of wealthy people and burn it, a, burn it up. But in fact, single payer health care has been good for Henry J. Kaiser. It's been good for the Kaiser Corporation. It's been good for every industry and every company that's ever implemented it. And why should the filthy capitalists have all the good stuff? It's time to share single payer with the rest of us. Why is it that we don't have single payer uh, uh, all over the country right now as a, as a national uh, mandate or whatever it is? It's sort of like asking why didn't the captain of the Titanic steer away from the iceberg? <laughs> you know, there's, there's a lot of momentum. We've got three trillion dollars spent each year on health care. That sounds like a lot of money. And it's more than just the largest industry in the United States. It's the largest industry in the world. You know, there's more money spent in American health care than in the Russian economy. If Vladimir Putin were smart, he'd leave Russia and become a titan of American health care and make even more money. So $3 trillion, you try to turn that ship just a couple degrees, and there are a lot of people who are going to be out hundreds of millions of dollars, no matter what you do. And what's the difference between Putin and Trump if uh, Putin is an authoritarian and well, where's Trump? Donald Trump wears a red necktie. <laughs> You know, let's not Never forget the obvious. Yeah. <laughs> also, Vladimir Putin is far more effective at being a ruthless dictator than Donald Trump could ever hope to achieve. That's true. But Trump will keep trying. Let's just wait. Um, 
question mark. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, I was. Uh, I, <laughs> I thought you so, were going to ask me something. No. So we should. It's a good segue into yeah. what can Donald Trump do for health care in Oregon? Well, let us take a break now for a few minutes and catch our breath and then answer that question and pursue with the rest of the prompting questions. And as you know, I ask for some prompting questions depending on my guests, and then I insert my own questions that come up to me. As in, but with you guys, there's never enough time. So let's take a break now so we have enough time, all right? Very break, good. Mr. Okay, we're back, and thanks for staying tuned. And for you viewers who missed the opening of the show, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one-hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like most of you out there about who they are as unique, one-of-a-kind individuals and about whatever it is that we have decided to talk about tonight, and we'll be talking about health care and how federal action might influence Oregonians' health care. Steve Weiss, welcome again, and Dr. Sam Metz, welcome again. So you asked the question before the break, and shall we start with that? Yes. Uh, it's not often we commend a president or a majority party in Congress for being a good example of a bad example, but the American health care plan that the House passed sort of has brought to the forefront everything that's wrong and objectionable in our health care system. It's almost an outline of how to do it wrong. Everything wrong. Yes. The, it has drawn to the forefront that the principal goal of the, uh, the Ryan plan is to reduce spending government spending on health care. And they've discovered there's a simple way to do it. Just reduce government spending on health care. Just don't come up with the pretense that it's good for people who don't get health care. And don't come up with the pretense that we'll be grateful that we won't get health care. That's the kind of discussion that President Trump has stimulated in this country. What do we want from a health care system? One thing that people want is to spend less, but now people are thinking there's more to health care than just spending less. There's access to health care, there's better outcomes. You know, when we talk about better care to more people for less money, this health care plan from the majority party has illustrated that getting any two of them is easy to get better care to more people, spend more money. For more people to get care and to spend less, give bad care. And if you want to spend less and get better results, then leave out sick people. But if you want all three of those, better care to more people for less money, it's got to have universal care. Doesn't that argument uh, skip the primary reason 
for people not having health care in this country. The primary reason for Ryan's plan is to have the wealthy get more wealth and more power. And the health care issue is just peripheral or secondary or even tertiary from the main thrust. The fight between the haves and the have-nots, and particularly the super-haves like you. you know. <laughs> well, in, in I fact, try by humor, uh, you know, Sam. Uh, I am a retired anesthesiologist, yes. and I'm not one of the one percent. Of course, but I am one of the five percent, and uh, I didn't get there because of my good looks and personality, and because God gave me my money. Uh, I got there because I had some very industrious parents and grandparents, a lot of luck, and that's not something that. I take for granted. I don't think if, well, if you can find yourself a rich uncle to pie your way through med school, you wouldn't be applying for food stamps. I think that, uh, you know, this trickle down theory of economics that if you give the wealthy a lot of money, that it trickles down to the rest of us ignores the fact that in the U.S., Money's the only commodity that flows uphill. Interesting. Uh -huh. uh, it takes an active effort to keep it from being sucked upward. And of course, we're not seeing that. So I want to talk a little about how the Trump administration's health care policy is threatening Oregon. The greatest threat is to Oregon's Medicaid program. Say that again? The greatest threat is to Oregon's Medicaid program. Okay. It's a threat, of course, to Medicaid nationally, too, because um, what the American Health Care Act, at least the House version of it, did was to make extremely painful cuts to Medicaid, cuts that would, in, uh, in Oregon, affect hundreds of thousands of people, actually. And the worst district it would affect happens to be the one that Representative Greg Walden uh, represents, which is an interesting irony, considering um, the degree to which he's given obeisance to Paul Ryan and to the Trump administration. The Medicaid program in this state is in trouble. It has to come up with something like $800 million to fulfill its part of a five-year extension of the Medicaid expansion in Oregon and those people who were added on the Medicaid expansion. Somewhere between 350,000 to 400 people, I don't know the exact number, but in that vicinity, were added to the Medicaid rolls in this state so that now we have over a million Oregonians on Medicaid. And what the administration and the Republicans in Congress do, are doing is, is, is a dire threat to the program. And we don't know how this is going to play out because the Senate is crafting its own version of the American Health Care Act, which will in some ways be different and in some ways be the same. And we won't know for sure until that version is crafted um, what it's going to say. There's a concept in Washington that the, the people who are dependent on Medicaid are these urban communities of color who vote Democrat. So it's fair game for the majority party to throw out these other people and protect the hardworking taxpayers who, who voted for them. One of the most unusual results of this last presidential election is we've discovered that America's latest, newest disenfranchised minority are nativist, Christian, working class, rural whites. That community is unique in the United States in seeing a decrease in life expectancy. It has the highest rate of suicide, it has the highest rate of alcohol-related morbidity and mortality, it has the highest rate of new opiate addiction, 
opiate opi uh, overdoses and deaths. Mm -hmm. And it's also the has the highest rate of firearms ownership and voting for Donald Trump. You know, it's part of a, a common sense of despair. There's a study from Princeton that came out and labeled this man new manifestation as death by despair. You know, there are 50 million people in the United death States who believe that Donald Trump represents their vision of America best. How did they come to think that way? <laughs> if nobody has ever spoken up for you, if nobody has mm. gone to bat to say you're important to me or even listen to you, the person you want to speak on your behalf will look and speak just like Donald Trump. He's defiant, he's uncompromising, he's unapologetic. You want somebody who's gonna pick these elite, elite up by the lapels, go no to nose with them and bark in their face. You don't much care about what, what's said. What you care is that your anger, your sense of disenfranchisement becomes embodied. Well, what happens if you're taught that something else is a, the reason for your plight in life rather than uh, what they're uh, arguing, it's like the in immigrants and Al-Qaeda and who knows all sorts of other reasons, mm -hmm. For them to have one aim in mind, whether they say it out loud or not, it's to what I said a moment ago, to increase the wealth and power of the ruling elite. These, these disenfranchised rural voters consider us the elite. We don't think of ourselves as elite, but we can, we have people speaking for us. Maybe not effectively. Donald Trump is a very talented con artist. His campaign was a con, but his governing makes it very clear what his real priorities are. What are they? <laughs> to increase the wealth of the class that he's part of and to really take, take what there is of a social safety net yeah. away from those tens of millions of people that need it. And I think slowly the truth is settling in that he is a liar and a hypocrite and that as time goes on, um, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't think he's, uh, his ratings in, in the public opinion polls are slowly going down. And I don't think he knows how to reverse that. I'm going to take issue with something you said. The, one of the latest polls of people who voted for Donald Trump, not voters generally, but people who said they voted for Donald Trump, 97% of them said he's doing a great job and they'd vote for him again. And of those 3% that think maybe I shouldn't have voted for him, None of them, of course, say, gee, I wish I had voted for Hillary Clinton. Well, I'm not sure the most recent polls are that high, but they may be close to that. I still think buyer's remorse will ultimately set in. People who voted for Donald Trump didn't vote for what making their lives better. They voted for him to make the lives of the disdainful elite worse, which these voters achieved by electing Donald Trump. And every time we get outraged by something he did, Donald Trump voters are saying, you go, guy. Now, I, I do a lot of speaking on healthcare, and I've learned to follow two rules when I am invited to speak on healthcare. The first is only take up half the time when I talk. Because really, what the audience wants isn't for them to hear me, but for them, for me to hear them. And the second rule is when someone asks me a question, the first thing I do is repeat it back to them so they know they've been heard. That's what these audiences want. They want to be heard, not necessarily obeyed, 
But if nobody's ever paid you any attention, and you've always been taken advantage of, and all of the goodies seem to go to somebody else, somebody just taking the time to listen and say, you tell me about your anger. You tell me what's, what's wrong and what you want to see done. That sympathetic ear is far more bonding, has far more productivity than any hectoring I can do to explain to them what they want from healthcare reform. The elephant in the room, I think I alluded to it, or I said a few words about it a, a few minutes ago. The diehard Trump supporters, uh, are out of their awareness for the most part, are behaving this way and voting for Trump because Trump and the media has convinced people the reason for your plight is not what we're doing or transferring wealth. The reason for your plight is that the uh, aliens are going to come over and the Mexicans and uh, the, the, the welfare queens and those uh, racism is rampant in our country. And the Trump supporters, diehards, are saying, well, the alternative is the Democrats. Well, it doesn't make any difference because the Democrats, we haven't changed our plight through the years, through generations, so why the hell should I go, go for a Democrat when it's not going to be different than what Trump's going to give me? So I'm talking, there's, uh, there's something going on in people in their thinking and why it is that they have uh, diehards for Trump. So let me say a couple of things, if I may. Mm -hmm. what, a lot of what Sam said is, said is true. The first thing to note is that Donald Trump would not be president if this country hadn't have been indolent enough for 150 years not to get rid of the Electoral College. So Trump's victory was enabled by people not being interested in getting rid of the, the Electoral College and making voting more democratic as a result. Why didn't they? With a small d. Why didn't they eliminate the Electoral College? Why didn't they? Why didn't they? I don't think they cared enough, and there, there was no movement to do so. Nobody thought this sort of thing was going to happen again. Uh, it happened in 2000, and maybe people should have paid attention then, but it hadn't happened before that, I think, since, since I don't know, the, the 19th century. Um, so there's that. There's also, I think, um, th I think there's a truism here in terms of changes that have to take place. Either the Democratic Party has to change and become a party of the people and not reap in profits for themselves, as too many Democrats have, and not associate with, you know, uh, the, the moneyed folks. Um, that has to change or we have to figure out some way to have a viable third party. That won't be easy. Third parties have not been viable in American history, at least in the last hundred years or so. But something has to change because the, um, because the way things are going is such that we could very well have class warfare in this country of a more serious kind than we've had in the past. Revolution. So it's always required a revolution for overthrow of these kinds of systems. Go ahead, Sam. Sorry. Well, uh, some things don't change. And you mentioned one of them. We all are tempted to blame someone else for what's wrong with our life. Mm -hmm. what, whoever you are, it's so easy to find a scapegoat for not being more successful, even amongst the wealthy. It's easy to blame the people who are taxing you be, for not having more wealth. That's not new. You, it wasn't invented by Donald Trump. What we see is a divide between rural America, which is amplified by the Electoral College. That's the principal sin of the Electoral College, is it amplifies the voices of rural voters, and the urban community. When I lived in Philadelphia, the star first baseman was John Cruck, who in an interview said, I come from a small town in West Virginia. It was so small that the baseball scout was the first guy I met that I hadn't met before. 
<laughs> and when we talk about strangers, it means different things in rural America and in urban America. Here in Portland, we see strangers every day. We interact with strangers. We talk to strangers. We buy things from strangers. We sell things to strangers. We have to drive around strangers. We, we see them on television. Strangers are all around us. We know who they are. When you're in a small community, a rural community, you might not ever see anybody who isn't a part of your community. Strangers are people who are out there. Trying to be compassionate for a stranger means different things to people who grew up in urban environments. You can't get much more urban than New York. Uh, and people who grow up in tiny towns. These people in tiny towns are the ones who are now talking. And they're not sure what they have to say because no one's ever given them the mic before except now there's Donald Trump. We don't have to... How about we, social media? In social media, it means something different in high school in Multnomah County than it does in Baker City or uh, okay. Coos Bay or Seaside. These are, you know, when we look around Oregon, 30, Hillary Clinton got a majority in only six out of Oregon's 36 counties and only got a plurality in eight of them. Every other county in Oregon went for Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And we know where they are. They're east of the Cascades and south of the Willamette Valley and on the coast. And we know what their politics are, too. Yes. The most important part of their politics is to listen to them. For us to go out there and say, tell me what's wrong. We short circuit the angst. These people would be grateful to have someone just listen to them. There's a quote from Lord Chesterfield that says, most men would rather you hear their plight than grant their wish. The key to recruiting people to do better in healthcare as in any other issue is to first listen to them and let them know they've been heard. Well, I think your responsibility is to tell them a little more about what's really going on and why it is they're unhappy, rather than just respond directly to their question. No one will listen to me unless I listen to them first. Of course. It's of like course. an investment in a bank. You can't take out money till you've made a deposit. Yeah. My, my wife, Margaret, is an instructional designer. She, uh, she designs uh, teaching programs for adult learners who don't want to learn, but they have to because it's part of their job. And she's reminded me that single-payer health care won't be built on information. It'll be built on relationships. It'll be built on trust. And surprisingly, it's easier to build trust with disenfranchised people than it, get, than it is to get them to sit still and listen to me talk for a half an hour on what they should want from health care reform. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying what you're doing is wrong. I'm saying there's something more that needs to be done. I agree. The first step before people will listen is for them to be heard. And I'm not quarreling with that. I'm saying hear them, but provide a little more information because your, your problem is not clear in your mind as what your problem really is. When I tell you a little more to consider along with how you see your problem, you might expand or see things somewhat differently. If you've looked at the programs that the Trump administration plans to cut mm -hmm. in the recent budget that was re released by the administration, they hit huge swathes of the population. Yes. If the administration is even halfway successful at cutting some of those programs, the pain will be spread out all over the country that immediately changes people. I don't know that the Republicans think that much about who they're going to hurt and what 
the, um, the consequences of that will be. All they think about is the dream that they've wanted for I don't know how many years. Hopelessness, yes. helplessness, and despair. You talked about it earlier. Yes, and you know, Steve mentioned that the parts of Oregon that will be most devastated by any of the health care plans in, that are being discussed in Congress now are the rural communities and in Greg Walton's district. Yet people don't vote in their own financial self-interest. They vote in their emotional self-interest, trying to convince people that this policy will lead to this financial impact on a family. When people are outraged, they're not going to follow that. You know, we need to work around the outrage and talk about people's families. And more importantly, listen to people's concerns about their families. If you let people talk long enough about what they want from a health care system, just take your hands off the wheel and let them talk, ask them questions. They'll get to single payer. Maybe not in that conversation, but they'll get there on their own. I'm going to try one more time. <laughs> they need to be aware of what they're weighing when they're having opinions. And I'm suggesting there's hidden messages that are being transmitted to them by the media and the super rich and those who are in control of the, the means of connecting and telling people what's really going on. They need to be aware of that. And in your job, if I were in your shoes, my job would be to give them a little information about the reality of what's going on and their decision about who's at fault and what to do to, to remedy it is flawed because I don't have enough information and I'm going to let that go now because Sam rescues me periodically when you and I are going at it here because uh, you're so damn good at what's going on it's hard to get around you and really challenge you. <laughs> but I'm aware of the time running out. So shall we just continue on being spontaneous or you want to talk about some of these things on the list here? I'm happy with being spontaneous. I love it. I love it. Don't you change it. <laughs> well, you know, the getting to single payer health care from a dead stop is a 12-step process. Okay discrete steps. Nobody's going to buy single payer until they buy universal care. Nobody's going to buy universal care unless they understand that there's a problem that universal care will solve. And nobody is going to define the problem until they acknowledge that there is a problem. These are all discrete steps. I agree with you, Don, that people eventually will benefit from learning more about how our health care system works and doesn't work and how their family is best protected with universal care. But that can't be the first conversation I have with them. Nobody will. Nobody's that interested in what I have to say. Until so, you listen to them. Thank you. Yeah. I spend a lot of time listening and maybe about 50% of the time it moves to the next step on that conversation. But usually I have to come back. How many people like you are in this movement that are going to connect with the people and have them do something about Trump? Not nearly enough. Oh, don't say that. Hopelessness, helplessness, no, no, powerlessness, no. come on. <laughs> okay, my, my job for your viewers Yes, of course. is to tell them, get involved with people who think differently. If okay. If you're always talking to the same people who always agree with you, you might as well be listening to Fox News. That's very powerful what you just said. So get out, listen to people who are saying unpleasant things, give them feedback so they know that you're listening. They will be so grateful. It's, man, it's sometimes it's frustrating because I, I attend different discussion groups to keep myself up on what's going on. and the. But most of my groups tend to be centrist or somewhat left, and now and then there's a right winger or near right winger, and I'm pushing him, and he goes really right wing, and then I look at how old he is or she is, and I, it's useless because uh, maybe over a long period of time I'm hearing a slight change, 
in your view on something we talked about six months or a year ago. Uh, talk about frustration and powerless and helplessness. I'm re betraying it right now. As important as single payer is, uh -huh. and it is because after all, it's health care. I, for one, can't afford to just concentrate on single payer. My field of action is the entire social safety net, both on the federal level, the state level, and the local level. Um, and it's that conglomerate, if you will, I will. of um, what could be a generous social welfare state like those in Sweden and Denmark and the Netherlands and Norway. That's socialism. Yes, that actually <laughs> is the point here. That okay. actually is the point. Okay. Why has Europe done this and why hasn't it happened in this country? I think there are myriad reasons for that. One of them is that we're separate. Another is that those countries were, with the exception of Sweden, were occupied during World War II and that changed everything, but we weren't. We were spared. Some people think by God being an agnostic leaning toward atheism, I think that's nonsense. But we, that, that being spared has spoiled us in many ways. You could say maybe our history has spoiled us too in the wrong way. But what I'm trying to do is to whip up support for the kinds of social welfare states that prevail in the Scandinavian countries. And um, that's not an easy thing to do because Americans have been brainwashed about government doing anything. Steve and I have a different approach here and both of us are pushing the pyramids one inch closer to the Nile, but we're pushing on different pyramids. So, for example, is my task easier or harder I focus on health care reform, specifically on universal care. Yeah. I believe that Steve's work is important. I can't sell a Trump voter on accepting a care for the stranger kind of moral philosophy. But I can talk to them about their family's health care needs and regardless of what they think about immigrants or about state-funded education or about welfare, I can come pretty close to getting them to understand that a universal care plan, plan is good for their family. A, a friend of mine in Corvallis is a Republican businessman who uh, carries on a group called Unlike Minds, mm -hmm. sort of like your discussion group, except he deliberately wants a variety. He mm -hmm. doesn't want to hear people saying what he thinks. The price of admission to this group is when you get to the group, you have to stand up, mm -hmm. say, hi, my name is Sam, and the last time I changed my mind on an important social issue was and if you can't do that, you don't get to talk. Wow. Sam is right. I mean, I mean, it's important that Sam does his advocacy, but I also like yes. to think it's important <laughs> that I do my advocacy. I'm impoverished. My countable monthly federal income is $735 a month, and the federal poverty level for a single person is $1,003 a month. I live well below the federal poverty level. That's why I do the kind of advocacy I do. That's why I spread myself thin, and I know I spread myself thin, but I don't feel I have any real choice if I want to advocate for the things that I'm advocating for. And the time has flown by already. We have about two minutes left, and you can each take about 45 seconds or an hour to say something to the viewers, <laughs> some closing comment. In fact, for, Look at that camera with for, for viewers 
over here. Take Dr. Don seriously. Treat each other kindly. Even people who are saying unkind things. If you can bond with these people, if they know that you're listening to them and you have their interests at heart, you can achieve far more than I can standing here wagging my finger on television and telling you, you ought to vote for single payer. <laughs> Steve, your turn. Okay. That's your camera. There are two basic philosophies of life. One of them was uttered by the late actor Charlton Heston, who said, if it happened to you, it's your fault. The other is a very old philosophy. It is there but for fortune go you and I. It's that philosophy that I live by. Well Whoa. <laughs> what a pair. Go what on, pair. Don. We you can't wait follow? seven years again. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tough act to follow. I think that Steve has, oh, yeah. has enshrined in just a few sentences how to make this a kinder, gentler country. There's a wisdom to you, an unusual wisdom. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see if we have a public service announcement to close out with. Uh, the ACLU, I love the American Civil Liberties Union. Without the ACLU, we'd be in more serious trouble than we are right now, even in the future with your friend Trump yes. in power now. We got end corporate personhood. Corporations are not persons. Never mind what the Supreme Court said. And money is not speech. Go to move to amend. And oh, thanks for watching the show. And remember KFC. Please remember KFC. Not Kentucky Fried Chicken, Dr. Don's KFC. <laughs> kind, friendly, and charitable. Be kind, be friendly, and be charitable to you too. And you too, and you too, <laughs> and you too, nurse. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs>